Good evening. Good evening, everyone. My name is Lindsay, and I am the Client and Lab Services Manager here at Examine. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to the final webinar in our 2023 Male Fertility Series. As you know, our webinars have taken place on a monthly basis, and we have been joined by many experts in their field of fertility treatments and or therapies. The views presented in our webinars are the views of our speakers and not necessarily of our company, Examine. You're all very welcome in joining with us this evening, so please let me introduce you to our speakers. We are delighted to have Professor Six Minhas for the last of our webinar series tonight. He is a key opinion leader in diagnosing and treating male infertility. He is internationally renowned for his research and Examine is pleased to have worked with him for many years. He believes in treating men and women equally and providing evidence-based medicine for both partners. Our chair, Professor Sheena Lewis, is the founder of Examine. She is widely published and has been an office bearer of UK and European learner societies for the past 20 years. Before I hand over to Professor Lewis, I will just run through some quick housekeeping. We will start with a welcome and an introduction from Professor Sheena Lewis. Then at approximately 6.15 to 6.45, we will have our guest speaker presentation followed by a Q&A session from 6.45 to 7 p.m. Please do pose questions throughout the talk using the Q&A panel, not the chat function. And Professor Lewis will then chair these questions during the Q&A session. If you experience any technical issues, please use the chat function and we will do our best to help you. Attendees will be muted throughout and videos enabled for our speakers only. All the events in the series are recorded and made available on the events page of Examine website. Please allow up to 24 to 48 hours for the recording to be available. One CPD point will be awarded for attendees for the one hour event and a certificate again will be circulated within 24 hours. At the end of the session, you will be invited to rate the event. Please do so and we welcome your feedback on tonight's webinar and suggestions for future sessions. So without further ado, I will now hand over to Professor Lewis to start the session. Good evening, everyone. Just let me get my um, slides up. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. It's, uh, well, I can't actually see you, but it's nice to know that you're there. Um, we're having a bit of a, an Indian summer here in Northern Ireland. We had a pretty wet summer up until now. Of course, the kids have gone back to school and the sun has come out. So I'm very much appreciative that wherever you are in the world, you've decided to be with us tonight. So tonight we're going to talk about optimising men's reproductive health before fertility treatment. And although this might be very obvious to some of you, it's actually something which doesn't really happen to a large extent in fertility clinics around the world. We are inclined to think if a man has enough sperm, then one of them will do, and we really don't need to worry too much about the quality. Now, the purpose of our webinars is to raise the awareness of male infertility and to provide men with knowledge and advanced testing. And we know that among the audience tonight, there will certainly be men who are um, having investigations and treatment. And we hope that we will be able to raise awareness of what you can do and what is possible to actually improve the quality of your sperm. The mission of our our company over the last 12 years has been to demonstrate that couple care can improve live birth rates. We can do things to improve what happens. We know the success rates in IVF are not particularly high. And so everything that we can do to make things better and to increase the chances of success are things that we want to take into consideration. And of course, we have this great audacious goal that we'll be able to help a million men on their fertility journey. Understanding the exact tests um, is very important because DNA is the one thing that's absolutely essential. DNA quality is absolutely essential for the uh, transmission of the male uh, genomic information to the child. It's the DNA that's going to make the, the child look and act like their dad. And for fertile men set a very high threshold for sperm DNA quality. Now we know if you look at a semen analysis, you can have 50% motile sperm and 50% dead sperm. We know if you look at um, morphology, there are very few sperm that are good quality, but actually in terms of DNA, fertile men have at least um, two thirds of their sperm that are good quality, sometimes even more than that. 
And we know that if you have high DNA damage, it leads to an increased risk of infertility, an increased risk of miscarriage, and a lower success rate by IVF. All our results are generated to an ISO 13485 certification, and we also have an ISO 15189 accreditation, which is now obligatory uh, with the HFEA. And so if you look at our fertile report, our fertility report, first of all, we'll give you the average amount of DNA damage across the whole uh, group of sperm that we've looked at. And then we will give you supplementary data that shows you how many good sperm you have and who, how many bad sperm you have. And it's all very simple, color coded within um, normal ranges and outside normal ranges. So that it's very, very easy for both clinician and patient to understand. In terms of our um, the evidence base for our test, which is extremely important to us because obviously I'm a professor, our speaker tonight is a professor, and we want everything that we are providing to be evidence based. And the evidence base for our test is based on 25 years of academic non-commercial result. We've looked at prescription drugs, we've looked at cannabinoids, we've looked at pentoxyphylin, we've looked at diabetes, we've looked at vasectomy, we've looked at men in miscarriage with a huge study, one of the, that in fact, the largest male fertility study that's ever been done in the UK. And at the moment, we're looking at an international study at DNA damage and unexplained infertility. Now, there are three or four tests around, as you probably know, and I just wanted to say very briefly how our test differs from the others. It's got the highest accuracy in terms of sensitivity, specificity, predictive power. It's the only test that actually reports the proportions of good and poor quality sperm and compares those with what you would have in a fertile man. It's the only test that gives you clinical thresholds for these three parameters I mentioned earlier, and you only need a small number of sperm, making it reliable for men with low sperm counts and for surgical retrieved sperm. And we pride ourselves on having a very fast turnaround for our results and a very good team whom all our clients say are most helpful and most sympathetic when they come on the phone with us. Now we have ongoing research into varicoceles. I, I don't know if Professor Minhas will talk about this tonight. I think he might, because it's uh, it's pretty, pretty topical. Um, we're looking at infection. We have done some work in the past in microbiomes. And again, I know um, Professor Minhas is an expert on this. And these are the sorts of things that are still going on in our company, because one of the things that we want to do, as well as actually have a profitable company, is to provide um, a platform to do research. Now, over the last number of years, there has been international acceptability for DNA testing. And I was just talking to Professor Meinhaus before we came um, online this evening, and he was um, saying that he has been involved, I know, in the European Association of Urology, and there are new guidelines coming out again, which are, again, going to be supportive of the fact that DNA testing is very important for a number of groups of people who are having problems at conceiving. And of course, the WHO manual a couple of years ago has actually brought um, DNA fragmentation testing in as an extended examination. It's no longer just a research tool. It's something that really has the credence to be used routinely. Now, when we come to Professor Meinhas himself, I could spend the whole evening talking about him because he has done so many things. He is a professor. He's an academic. He's a consultant andrologist at Imperial College. He trained at the University of Sheffield, and then he trained specifically in andrology at, um, at UCL, University College London. He has published extensively, and there are many more publications um, which are going to appear in the next couple of years. And he's been a co-chair on very, very important international committees with guidelines which are going to improve our um, clinical practice. And he's one of the only UK dedicated andrological surgeons. There aren't too many around. There are a number of urologists, as you know, but there aren't so many who are actually dedicated to andrology and the whole um, area of male fertility. So I'm going to hand the floor over now to Professor Meinhas. He's going to talk about how we can optimize our reproductive health before we have fertility treatment. I'm very much looking forward to hearing what he has to say, and um, I hope you are too. Professor Meinhaus, the floor is yours. Thanks, Sheena. Um, let me just get my slides up. Um, can you see my slides? There we go. Yes, we can see them. Wonderful. Okay. 
So thanks very much for that introduction. Very kind of you, actually. And um, it's great to be able to talk about you in terms of the work you've done. Um, and certainly optimizing men's reproductive health before fertility treatment is very important. It's interesting that men are often not assessed uh, for fertility problems. And the the old adage that if you've got sperm, then we can use it, I think is beginning to change now. And I think it's important to realize that fertility or male fertility or infertility certainly has repercussions in terms of general health as well, which I'm going to talk to you about. As Sheila mentioned, I do sit on a guidelines committee with the EAU guidelines. And therefore, what I try and do is provide you with evidence base and the evidence base. Clearly, the data out there is very mixed, but I'll try to give you some idea by looking at all of this data, how we could kind of shoehorn this into a, a management plan or uh, which is basically streamlining uh, men's health. So. Infertility, I think you're all aware of the definition, whether this should be 12 months, but certainly we generally use this as 12 months period of regular unprotected intercourse. And it's interesting that up to 50% of cases are due to a male factor. Now, clearly in a female partner who is older, um, certainly by the age of 35, we may be saying, well, look, if you haven't conceived by six months, you should certainly be seeking advice. There's multiple causes of male infertility. And um, these are either genetic, which are either things like Kleinfelter syndrome or alternatively other genetic problems, um, infections, which we can talk about, not in the strictest sense of infections directly causing infertility, but as Sheena was talking about, it's DNA fragmentation, trauma, people may have had surgery in the past, um, iatrogenic, in other words, surgery or medicine itself causes problems. And these kind of patients may have had surgeries for cancers, may have had removal of organs, may have had removal of testis, testis cancer or chemotherapy treatments as well. So drugs as well can also cause problems. I'm going to talk a little bit about something called testicular dysgenesis. Why do people get fertility problems? Why have semen counts deteriorated in the last 50 years? You'd have probably read lots of uh, newspaper articles on that. But what's really interesting is this group of so-called unknown patients or idiopathic group of patients where we don't know what the cause is. And often men will have normal semen analysis in this setting. So what's really important, and these are some of the guidelines we've written, that you should obviously also include the male in the workup. So often we see patients and I see patients who have gone straight for IUI, IVF or ICSI, i.e. assisted reproductive technologies without an adequate uh, workup in terms of uh, male fertility, which is very important because ultimately you may find certain things that are correctable. You may find lifestyle issues that might be important in terms of trying to reverse the effects. So we advocated these guidelines a full andrological assessment in really all men in, with couple infertility. And we use the term not loosely couple, but it is a couple. And that's what we've got to remember based upon some of the facts I've given you. And of course, semen analysis is the key of that. But also we tend to do hormone checks as well, genetic tested in some patients dependent upon the sperm count, uh, as well as something called Y microdeletion testing, particularly in those patients who may not have sperm or extremely low sperm counts of less than a million. So there are a battery of tests that we'd offer. These guidelines, in fact, highlight again what Sheena has said about sperm DNA fragment testing. testing. And what we have actually said in these guidelines is that sperm DNA fragmentation should be performed in assessment of couples with recurrent pregnancy loss from natural conception, assisted reproductive technologies, or men with unexplained infertility, because that could be an underlying factor. There are clearly very much patients who will have their own individual uh, investigations that they would need dependent upon the cause of their infertility and dependent upon their semen parameters as well. We also highlight that it's important to treat infections as well. And infections themselves, there are our own bacteria can cause uh, DNA fragmentations we've shown in studies and others have shown, but also can affect possibly the outcomes from IVF treatments. Although again, we need more data to support that, but we generally screen in for infections in patients with DNA fragmentation uh, would be important as well. But also asking about past history of infections because that may have caused cause problems such as um, obstructions or blockages, which might cause no sperm in the ejaculate. 
The issue is a lot of the time when we see patients, we often see patients who are started on empiric treatments or therapies. These are hormone treatments to try and raise sperm counts. The level of evidence, we have to be very careful about that. These are drugs such as um, things called CERM or Clomid or Tamoxifen, which try and boost the levels of FSH and LH in the brain, which try and stimulate sperm production. Therefore, in this context, it's very difficult to give any strong advice about whether to use these these drugs and i think that it all depends upon whether men have low testosterone levels so in terms of trying to boost your fertility it's a very controversial area in terms of using these medications and often we want to prescribe a drug to a patient a patient wants a drug to see if it helps but there are certain circumstances that we can use and i'll talk about that shortly in terms of antioxidants, you can't make any clear recommendations, but more and more data, and these guidelines are going to be updated shortly, would indicate that antioxidants may improve semen parameters, but also lower DNA fragmentation, although, again, there are some conflicting studies in that regard. Of course, you've got to weigh up the risk benefit of the use of antioxidants, and there are many antioxidants on the market as well. We've talked about the use of um, CERM, which I'm going to allude to in a second, which is these anti-estrogens, which some people argue. Uh, can be a cause. But what I wanted to focus on as well as part linked to this, which you'll see shortly, is also about general health as well, optimizing general health. So why do we think that people get fertility? Why have semen parameters deteriorated in the last 50 years? Well, the answer may be this theory proposed by somebody called Skakabak. And the argument is that environmental factors um, such as estrogenization or industrial chemicals may cause something called testicular dysgenesis, which is a testicle that becomes dysgenetic or changed and you get disturbed hormone function and sperm function these testes and interesting there's a lot of data now being presented showing that these chemicals called endocrine disrupting chemicals within the environment or exposure in utero may cause reduced semen quality high predispositions to testis cancer in infertile men and also undescended testis and also hyperspadius where the urethra opens up um, in an abnormal position. So there's enough evidence now beginning to support this. And therefore, what we begin to think is that the so-called endocrine disrupting chemicals may be a factor why men presented with infertility that was so-called unexplained. What's really interesting is taking that into account, if you look at testicular function, you begin to see that there is actually an increased risk, not only of fertility problems, but also chronic medical conditions in men. And there's a higher risk of hypertension, diabetes, um, hyperlipidemia, and long-term cardiovascular disease in patients who are infertile. So it's quite fascinating that often we just simply talk about having a baby, but actually there's a much wider context in terms of optimizing one's own health in this setting, which is also interlinked with something I'm going to talk about called metabolic syndrome. What's really interesting as well is the risk of these cancers as well. There's a higher risk of um, various cancers, including testicular cancers in men with infertility and then you can see this in some of these here and also men with azospermia or no sperm have a high risk of cardiovascular risk so we begin more and more to understand the link maybe linked to this testicular dysgenesis theory as well testosterone is really important as well so often men won't with lower semen parameters have a full check and look at their testosterone levels one third of men or we showed up to 50 percent of men have low testosterone who have lower semen parameters low testosterone long term it's important to realize um, not only causes symptoms in terms of reduced libido erectile dysfunction but also can cause an increase in weight so related to metabolic syndrome depression and a predisposition to type 2 diabetes and long-term cardiovascular disease so so you've got to remember that fertility itself is a biomarker of long-term health, which I think is very important, which I think Sheila highlighted also about DNA fragmentation. There's interestingly a link between testosterone and something called metabolic syndrome, where you get an increase in waste adiposicity or fat, which then results in a lower testosterone and a predisposition to cardiovascular risk. So therefore, when we see patients who have fertility problems, it's important to do hormone checks in these patients to ensure that these patients are not at high risk of metabolic syndrome long term. Now, it's interesting that weight, and if we talk about factors that you can try and do to try and improve uh, your semen parameters, just in the strictest uh, conventional context of semen parameters and quality, you can see actually that BMI or high BMI is associated with um, semen parameters. In fact, losing weight does improve semen parameters. We've shown a recent study, uh, which has been published recently, that losing weight using an NHS diet does improve semen parameters. So therefore, doing simple things may improve um, 
treatment outcomes, in particular losing weight, uh, Mediterranean type diets, all of this. The direct correlation association is very much something that needs further studies though. Again, metabolic syndrome and smoking. So we talk about smoking and men who have metabolic syndrome have a higher risk of infertility for the reasons I've outlined, but also smoking as well is also associated with um, uh, problems in terms of semen parameters. And what's really interesting is patients who remain childless, the men have a high risk of metabolic syndrome. Fascinating because actually, you know, it would imply therefore there is an underlying metabolic component to why this is the case. And in fact, in certain studies as well, metabolic syndrome, as Sheila alluded to in some of the animal studies and diabetes have been shown to have a higher DNA fragmentation. So it's really important to get your general health um, in, in check because many of these factors will be important. Undescended testes are very common. So many times we see patients who have undescended testes who present or a past history. We know that if you've had an undescended testis as a child, you have a higher risk of fertility problems and also cancers. But we've also got to remember that even in the absence of undescended testis, there is a higher risk of testis cancer in infertile men. And that's been well documented. And in fact, <clears throat> in men who also have testis cancer, there is a higher risk of having no sperm and also abnormal semen parameters. So it's also very, there's also that link there again, going back to that testicular dysgenesis theory as well. I'm going to slip through these slides because these are more um, uh, in terms of related to kind of clinicians. So varicocils are also very common. And one, one of the most important things is to examine a patient to see if they have a varicocil. The problem with varicocils is this, is varicocils are very common and up to 15% of men with normal semen parameters or who follow the child will have a varicocil. So therefore there's a controversy about who to treat. And one of the problems is because they're so common is, are they an incidental finding or are they truly causing a problem in the infertile male? The problem there is you've got to then weigh up the age of the female partner and also the age of the male as well, and also the, their ovarian reserve in terms of determining whether you should be treating a varicocil. And these are some of the questions that really we should we we've asked previously, but now have some of the answers to all of this. So, for example, varicocils are varicose veins; they cause heat damage. They, in theory, create reactive oxygen species, which might damage <coughs> sperm DNA and also may cause problems in terms of. Um, something called apoptosis or cell death in terms of uh, sperm function uh, or the sperm itself. So certainly in some patients, if the female partner is young, got good ovarian reserve, there's a large varicocele because they're graded one to three, and certainly two and three are considered clinically significant, i.e. ones that you can either feel or ones that are visible. And this one in this case is one that is visible and standard. You might wish to treat because you might want to have a chance to try and get a natural pregnancy. Some clinical varicocils are different. These are varicocils that normally are demonstrated on an ultrasound scan, and therefore we don't think are clinically significant. And again, the data is weak. It's interesting about sperm DNA fragmentation. We'll talk a little bit about that in a second, and varicocils and their association. And should these varicocils be treated before assisted reproductive technologies? So even if you're going to go for IVF treatment and you've got a varicocil, is there evidence to support treating that in the context of raised DNA fragmentation? fragmentation and outcomes as well and in fact even with men with no sperm in the ejaculate there is an argument that treated varicocils might induce sperm production in these patients in about 15 percent and might ultimately result in uh, improved sperm retrieval rates because you can then directly take sperm directly from the testicle itself so if you look at the data and i don't want i want to simplify this is there is evidence on a number of studies showing that treating varicocils in men to try and improve natural fertility in other words or natural conception rates is there but i think you've got to choose the patient and in particular highlight the fact as i already alluded to it's got to be a clinically significant varicocele and i think you've also got to make sure that the female partner has good ovarian reserve in other words has good fertility in non-obstructive age of sperm, in no sperm, there's some evidence I already alluded to that fixing the varicocele may get sperm induction within the ejaculate and also may, in fact, um, improve your chances of finding sperm. When we look at sperm DNA fragmentation, we've talked already about that. She has talked about lifestyle, age, and obesity. We talked about some of these factors, drugs, chemotherapeutic agents and their effect on DNA fragmentation. We talked about pollution, toxins, and we also talked about cancers in effect. And these result potentially in sperm DNA fragmentation or damage. She has already shown this slide. I'm not going to dwell on this, but this is a study that we looked at as a predictive marker in terms of outcome. 
What's interesting about varaxel going to DNA fragmentation is that if you look at varaxel repair in men with no sperm, again, the data highlights that it might be worthwhile fixing. And certainly what we've said that in the guidelines that we've written is that certainly in patients with a clinical varaxel with a female with good ovarian reserve, you might want to fix a varaxel. But interestingly, what we also added in, varaxelectomy may be considered in men with raised DNA fragmentation with otherwise unexplained infertility or have suffered from failed assisted reproductive techniques. Now, we put a weak recommendation because we don't have that many trials or randomized trials, and that's what we rely on, but there is enough evidence to support fixing varaxels in that setting. The biggest problem, I think, and one of the areas of you know we need to focus on is what about those patients who have normal semi parameters who have difficulty conceiving who have a normal, who have raised DNA fragmentation, but may have a female partner of good ovarian reserve, what do you do then? And that's a really difficult one, group of patients. And do you treat that varicose? Because historically we treat varicose in this setting here. But I think in that setting, it would be reasonable now to treat patients based upon these guidelines. We talked a little bit about optimization, management of oxidative stress, and again, looking at the taking antioxidants, the data would indicate there is some evidence or some evidence suggesting that uh, taking antioxidants that many of you are familiar with may improve um, uh, the outcomes in terms of improving conventional semen parameters. One of the issues, of course, there is also data contradicting that. This is one such study called the MOXIE study, which showed, interestingly, we have to be very transparent. As Sheena says, she's done a lot of research as well, that there was no effects on DNA fragmentation or semen parameters in this small trial. Again, there is enough data out there, meta-analytical data, supporting the role of taking antioxidants in the setting of even unexplained infertility, but also in the setting of patients who uh, might be trying to reduce their DNA fragmentation. What's and what I've tried to touch upon is some of the controversial areas as well. So this is a study here. Should you be taking sperm directly from the testicle? Because in some men, despite the fact that we screen them for infections, we adopt lifestyle measures, take antioxidants, we may fix the varicose, we still may not lower the DNA fragmentation. And therefore, what do you do in that setting? There has been a vogue for taking directly from the testicle, testicular sperm. And again, one must be careful because this is quite invasive. So in other words, using this sperm for ICSI treatment. And in that setting, it's very difficult to give guidance. But many of the studies that we've that we've looked at, we've recently about to publish a study showed that although there does seem to be an improvement in live birth rates and pregnancy rates by taking testicular sperm when the DNA fragmentation is raised. The problem is often patients who use as their own controls and have failed previous cycles and naturally you'll see an improvement. But overall, the data is very heterogeneous. In other words, we need more data, more trials in this very difficult area as well. In terms of DNA fragmentation specifically and in terms of the assessment, we've also published this guideline in terms of a consultation guide as well about when to do this. I think you've also got to now look at the way forward in terms of men, in terms of particularly those men who have no sperm. And in that setting, we often either have men who have a blockage, which potentially could be unblocked, or we have those patients who have, don't have a blockage. And one of the things is about doing sperm extraction in these patients. So we still consider the micro TZ or opening up the testicle in these patients with a 50% sperm retrieval as the gold standard. There is a vogue for putting needles into the testicle, again, to try and find sperm and various methods to do this as well. But overall, um, there are some people who say, well, how do you optimize treatment beforehand if you did a sperm extraction with somebody with no sperm, if that's the route that you've got to follow? And we talked a little bit earlier about these various medications and tablets that might be used to try and stimulate and optimize treatment in those men with no sperm. In that setting, um, the level of evidence is quite weak, although if somebody's got a low testosterone or borderline, remember related possibly to metabolic syndrome, that testicular dysgenesis, you might want to try and raise testosterone before you do a sperm extraction, but the data is quite weak. And often we also use other drugs such as HCG um, to try and stimulate sperm over a uh, four month period to try and see whether or not sperm extraction is useful in this setting. In order to try and answer the question was, was it useful in terms with no sperm, men with no sperm, and in terms of outcome of finding sperm or improving our chances of men with no sperm? We did this meta-analysis published um, recently in 2022 and found that actually those men would have raised FSH and LH hormones, in other words, non-obstructive agents, there was very little point in giving 
hormone therapy with no statistical improvement in terms of sperm retrieval rates, which you kind of almost expect because the brain is already compensated. The group of patients that seem to respond, if at all, again, trial data needs to be more robust, was that group had normal FSH and LH levels. So in my clinical practice, unless testosterone level is very low, and I'd say less than eight, I would not normally stimulate or give hormone therapy prior to sperm extraction um, in those men who don't have sperm and we've kind of highlighted this again in these guidelines which I don't dwell on so to summarize I think that in terms of optimization you've got to look at various other factors and I think it men's health is really the importance here. I think couples should be treated as a couple, both the male and female, because there are many ramifications of male infertility. We've already kind of talked about them in terms of hypogonism or low testosterone, the problems in terms of metabolic um, uh, syndrome as well, which we talked about, cardiovascular risk as well. I think it's important often to see a dietitian to reduce weight because of these factors. Erectile dysfunction or quality of life is also important in these patients because they may have low testosterone as well. The stress of infertility may result in erectile dysfunction as well. We mustn't forget the psychology of this as well. We also have to mention that cancers and previous history of uh, toxins, gadatotoxins as well, is very important to ascertain in your history. Men with undescended testis or a history of undescended testis are higher risk of infertility as well. So you begin to see that overall, there is a really important aspect in terms of the interrelationship between male infertility and general health and trying to optimize that general health based upon uh, what I've said so far. And I think I'm going to stop there because I think I've spoken uh, long enough, but thank you very much. I'm going to stop sharing my um, slide set there. Thanks very much, Sheila. That was super. Thank you very much. That's uh, given us lots to, to talk about and lots to, to think about. Um, we'll start off with a couple of questions from the audience. And one of them is, uh, it's a very simple one, is high pH in the semen an indicator of infection? Um, I, I have to say that, you know, if you, it's a very, I don't tend to look at it that much, actually, if I'm honest with you. The setting that I tend to look at it, and I'll answer the question in a minute, is um, patients who may have congenital absence and a vast deference. I think pH is... Yes, there is some evidence for that. But then you're going to look at the other parameters. If you feel that there's a high white cell count within the ejaculate, fine. But generally speaking, we often see this, and it may be of no clinical value in that setting. I think if there's concern about this, or you see somebody with raised DNA fragmentation in that setting, then it's fine, send it for semen culture. But what we also got to remember about infections is the concept that infections themselves not causing symptomatic infections, but rather something called dysbiosis, the balance of bacteria, not only in men and women, has been shown to be uh, a factor in terms of infertility and this balance. So, for example, as you know, lactobacilli in women, for example, you know, are protective, whereas other types of bacteria may not be protective. And therefore, I think it's important to take on board. It's not so much about infection per se, but clearly there'll be some patients you'll see who will have prostatitis, inflammation, or be diagnosed with true infection. But it's really talking about the balance of bacteria uh, per se, as opposed to infection uh, per se. Mm -hmm. Well, I know uh, Andrea Saloni, uh, one of your, your close colleagues, has written a paper talking about the primary fertility setting where 20% of men had asymptomatic um, infections. Yeah. And that this is something, you know, which we're not looking at at all. And very, yeah. very simple antibiotics could actually improve their semen parameters within a couple of months. Well, what do you think? Should we be screening for those? I think it's a difficult one. I mean, we did a study, in fact, published last year, uh, looking at bacteria and asymptomatic carriage rates in association with DNA fragmentation. And there was. But the trouble is, is controlling this and looking yeah. at control patients. That's where the problem arises, because many of these bacteria will be normal skin commensals. Now, if you talk to a microbiologist, many of them, for example, like urea plasma or mycoplasma, many of them would say, well, actually, um, you know, the, these are, you know, normal commensals in many cases or enterococcus in particular. But we know that from systematic reviews, in fact, meta-analyses we published, that many of these are associated with semen parameters as well. I, you know, it's difficult, isn't it? I think that are you going to justify screening a population of men 
go in for assisted reproductive tolerant technology or infertility who are asymptomatic, that has cost benefit implications as well. And so therefore, from that perspective, I think it's difficult to justify without more data. And we need more control data. That's that's really what we need. So I think that clearly, you know, one of the things that I would do certainly is a patient who have got a raised DNA fragmentation, who may have, um, you know, failed ART uh, miscarriage, then it certainly may be worthwhile performing, um, you know, PCR analysis uh, to look for these various uh, bacteria and to treat them. Now, the microbiologists might shoot me down and say, well, actually, you're going to create more resistance to bacteria. So therefore, I think each individual case is has to be treated as an individual case mm-hmm. and the circumstances yeah. of that in terms of the clinical scenario. I mean, there is a theory that um, infertility is contagious, and of course, there are so many yep. whether it's male and female factors. Absolutely. Which is you're, rather, you're, you're... Um, it's rather unusual. I mean, you would expect the problem to be a male problem or a female problem. And that would go back to the point that actually the microbiome of the male and female can affect each other and you know can can cause nasty ramifications. What what would you say about that? Yeah, I mean, there is, there are, you, I know you're aware, I mean, gosh, um, I think the paper that you're referring to is 2016 published, I think, by somebody in 2016, which showed that there seems to be a bacteria which is transmitted from both the male to the female partner, vice versa. So, but that data was quite weak. I mean, as I recall, you know, don't shoot me down, but I think there was only about 24 patients in that study. Yeah. So there is, there is that theory. But again, I think, you know, we need more data, don't we? Yeah. But it's beginning just to begin to move. But the trouble is we, we, we're still kind of, the problem with it, as you know, and you talked about research earlier, is that, you know, male fertility is really underfunded and we don't get the funding that we need and we want. Yeah. So therefore, in order to answer these very important questions, we have to rely on retrospective and not case controlled studies. And rather, we need controlled studies that are prospective. And that's the really big problem here. So, you know, we suffer, you know, to in order to get the, you know, financial funding for these studies that will answer hopefully these important questions. Oh, I, I couldn't agree more. And, and you know, I've sat on, on, on so many committees where we've been scoring abstracts and the andrology abstracts always come out as the poorest group. And the reason for that is there's never been any funding. It's, you know, something's been done um, just as a little bit of a pastime. It's got tiny numbers. And, yeah. um, and I go, oh, gosh, is that the very best we can do? But I must say, in, in my career, I have seen a huge improvement in the sense of a multidisciplinary team coming on board. You know, 20 years ago, fertility um, clinics were run by gynecologists, obstetricians, and now there is a much greater interest from urologists, from andrologists. And I think this can only be good because if you have equality of care, which, of course, we haven't had, I mean, it's been an absolutely yeah. absurd situation where, you know, 50% of the, the DNA comes from the male, 50% comes from the female, and yet in the fertility clinic, we spend 95% of our time looking at the, you know, the, the ovum, and, and we don't really worry about the sperm at all. So that's I, I changing, agree. and that can only be good. But I think if you look at it historically, you know, you would argue that, look, if you've got, I've got sperm, you get the sperm and the egg together, we have a baby, then what's the question you're asking, as in, you know, to an andrologist. But what I try to highlight there is the importance of your own health in all of this. And often we will, st- even now we still see a lot of patients go through an IVF process and never being assessed. And there are, as you've already seen, the, the pathologies that are involved that are long-term sequelae of um, men's health, in terms of men's health long-term, is obviously very important. So I would agree with you entirely. Great. Now, we, we, we have a very faithful attendee, Gulen Badiger, who comes to all our webinars, and he's got three questions here. So I'm going to get, give him an opportunity to ask you these questions. The first one is a compliment. Wonderful talk. What evidence is there that treating infection does improve sperm parameters? I think you've probably answered that. Uh, I'm not sure if you have anything else you want to, to add to that. No, except to say that we do need more studies, you know, yeah. and the problem is, is that, you know, we also got to weigh up the the issue of, um, you know, bacterial resistance as well. So we, we must also take that into account, which is why I said it has to be individually based, um, you know, and these clinical scenarios. Yeah. Uh, well, the next question is, what antibiotics would you use, um, if any, 
if you if you had high well, I, I would prescribe empiric antibiotics without bacteriological evidence uh, on di in terms of diagnostics of an infection um so the common the problem is i mean there are groups now doing next generation sequencing of uh the, the seminal microbiome um, yes. there are some of these commercially available groups <laughs> it's very difficult because um are we at that point do we have enough evidence to support you know um ngs in this setting i'm not sure i think we've got to be very careful and we've always kind of if we look at technology it always seems to have gone so far ahead but yet we need to get the basics right so i certainly wouldn't be given blind antibiotics the setting that i would do it is if i see ureoplasma or mycoplasmas the problem is also often when we do screening on the conventional screening that we do on PCR, you often see Gardnerella, for example, Gardnerella and its association very weak. In any non contraceptive couple, you will see Gardnerella. So I think that it you have to be very, very careful. And what we've got to be very careful about is antibiotics. So I would not give empiric antibiotics as, as you know, in somebody, because you've got to say, well, why are we giving the antibiotics? What is the source? And where is the evidence for an infection? I yeah. think that's what you... Okay. Yeah. Well, well, Gunn's last question is to suggest that we're doing things that we know don't work. And why do we continue to do that? You know, on one hand, you're saying we've got to be very wary about bringing in new technologies. But, for example, Clomid, I mean, is, is there any evidence that's worth talking about that actually shows that it improves sperm production, improves spermatogenesis? Well, there, there is. I mean, there are, you know, there are studies. Um, the problem is that many of these studies are, again, small cohort studies. Yeah. And the argument is if you look at, so if, for example, you get a patient with no sperm in the ejaculate, you know, you often, many of these studies don't follow up the patient long enough or have done semen analysis beforehand. So you might be cryptosispermic. In other words, the patient may get sperm appear and disappear. So without following them longitudinally, long term, say even up to a year, you don't know that. So often when we see a small amount of sperm appearing in ejaculate on clomid for four months, we say, oh, it's a success. But actually, how do you know that that patient wasn't producing tiny quantities anyway? Yeah. I think we need more trials. That's the issue about the use of these drugs. Remember, these drugs are off-label, so they're unlicensed for the treatment in men, actually. But we tend to give them in empiric treatment. So we must also remember the side effect profile of some of these drugs. They do have side effects, um, you know, including thromboembolism as well, which has been uh, described in case reports or isolated cases. So we've got to be very, very careful about the use of these drugs and medications. Now, clearly, if somebody is symptomatic, and they've got no sperm or a very low count, you're not going to give them testosterone. But if they're symptomatic of low testosterone, then you might want to consider giving sperm as an alternative to raise testosterone without potentially affecting fertility or having paradox, you know, negative effects as exogenous testosterone does, which again, you know, one needs to highlight that many men bodybuild, which we haven't done so far, take exogenous testosterone recreationally, which will impair your sperm production. And so often we see that. So it's also important to realize that taking testosterone is going to impair your sperm production whereas raising it other ways potentially can so answer the question i think we need more data about that yes i i think you know a terrible message has gone out to men that if they go to the gym and they sort of build their bodies and you know with anabolic steroids you know they're going to be really butch fantastic men and we had a case recently where a man had, had no sperm in his ejaculate after chronic oh. use of, of testosterone and he had no idea i mean he, yeah. he had absolutely no idea that he was doing damage to himself and we haven't got those messages out that men have got to protect their sperm and protect their fertility. In fact, we're giving them the wrong message altogether. Yeah, sure, absolutely. And um, I was delighted to hear you say that you had done a study where losing weight had actually led to um, an improved uh, semen quality because one of the worries that I have is we have so much evidence to show that, you know, if you've got a bad lifestyle, if you drink too much alcohol, if you take anabolic steroids, if you smoke, all these things impair your sperm quality. But we have so few studies that actually show that improvements in lifestyle improve sperm parameters. Could you tell us a wee bit more about that one? Yeah, I mean, it's just come out. Um, I think that it's interesting that if you look historically, that if you look at a lot of studies, most of the meta-analyses, in fact, we just published another one showing that there is an improvement in semen parameters or fertility um, in terms of conventional parameters. It's interesting that bariatric surgery, for example, and it's an interesting point that doing bariatric surgery doesn't, strangely, in a lot of studies. 
seem to improve your CIMA property. That's which a disappointment. Would, it's strange, yeah, which is a big disappointment, isn't it? Because everybody would be able to have bariatric surgery. So we looked at various diets and actually taking a low calorie diet, um, you know, even an NHS plan diet seems to improve um, mainly motility in that setting. There is some evidence, of course, that, you know, DNA fragmentation also can be removed. But again, we are limited by studies and often we don't have a control group as well. And so therefore, I think that we've got to always remember that we need more studies. We need larger cohort studies. And what would be a fascinating study, wouldn't it, that looking at, although you might not improve natural conception, but and that's the other end point that nobody really looks at is, you know, the end point of live birth rates. But what would be interesting is looking at weight. We'd always look at female weight, don't we, in terms of IVF treatment. Yeah. But what about male weight? What about asking men to reduce weight, optimise their health before IVF compared to a group who did? And looking at IVF outcomes, would there be a difference? Looking at their DNA, and I bet you find there probably would be. So I think there's there's lots and lots of things here that this has ramifications about. But certainly, I think it is in your own health best interest to lose weight anyway, as I already alluded to in terms of your uh, general men's health and metabolic syndrome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Could I ask you a little bit more about the, the barrack seal repair? Um, now, there are sort of um, two schools of thought. You know, one is that a, um, an embolization is the way to go and that's you know there's a f faster recovery and it's not as expensive and it, it's more rapid but there's the old sort of old-fashioned you know going in having surgery yeah. which which would you which which would you recommend or could oh. you yeah, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a good point, Sheila. I mean, it, it's been raised. There are no randomized studies comparing either modality of treatment. Mm -hmm. So for me, if I was a patient, in, in the UK, we tend to do more embolization, i.e. putting coils down, sclerotherapy. Because yes. in a sense for fertility, I would argue that if I was, if I had a varicocele, what treatment would I want? Would I want a treatment that involves surgery, particularly when I don't know if it's going to make a difference? Mm -hmm. Would I want two weeks off work? Would I want to have a general anaesthetic? No is the answer. So therefore, in all my patients now, the only time I do varicocele repair is now really on those patients who are recurrent varicoceles. And overall, if you look at the data, there's not a huge amount of difference in good hands. And the problem is a lot of the data we see about microsurgical varicocelectomy is based on American data, but there are no randomized trials. And recent Cochrane analysis showed that overall the data does not really support uh, microsurgical varicocelectomy as being superior to embolization. So I would say that if you're going to treat a patient with a varicocele, then I think it's perfectly acceptable to, to send your patient to a, a somebody who's a high volume um, interventional radiologist who does this. I think that's entirely reasonable. Um, patients may prefer, you know, after reading to do microsurgical approaches, that's fine. But I think that it's perfectly reasonable to do embolization uh, oh. in that sense. Now, how long would you leave it after surgery before you would think about having ART? Well, historically, if you look at, I mean, I showed you some of the metro analysis, but I did show you one metro analysis, and there are a number of them, as you're aware, showing that fixing barracks was before ART improves outcomes in terms of live birth rates or pregnancy rates. Often live birth rate isn't actually looked at as pregnancy rate they rely on. And we don't know, it's interesting with DNA, what's going to happen in terms of miscarriage, you know, yeah, long term. That's an interesting yeah. aspect. But really, we should be reported on live birth rates. Of course, really. of course. More it's just that those are such huge studies and such long yeah. studies. And if you think it's a, you know, it's a, an undergraduate or it's someone who's taking a year out to do a study, they aren't there for long enough to actually yeah. catch the, the yeah, sure. Birth. But I think meta-analytical data would support varicoselectomy before um, ART. Definitely. I mean, there is enough evidence to support that. And, so, and that's the whole issue, isn't it? That you see sperm and, you know, you say, uh, you know, an IVF unit will say, yeah, we've got sperm here. We're going to use it. But the problem is, is that how good is that sperm? What is the actual integrity of that sperm, as you've rightly said? And the biggest problem here is what if you have a normal semen analysis, but a DNA fragmentation is raised and they have a varicocele? Conventionally, historically, we would not be treating a patient with normal semen parameters with a varicocele. But now I think we're changing a little bit and say, well, actually, we need to look a little bit further. To answer the question about how long, well, if you looked historically at studies, they would say six months to a year. Now, I think that more recent studies have shown four months. I, I mean, 74 days or a new wave of sperm production would be perfectly reasonable in that setting. I suppose the longer you leave it, probably the better, because also there's some animal studies showing that use of antioxidants with varicocelectomy seems to improve uh, parameters more uh, compared to no antioxidants alone so i think probably six months is a is a good amount but certainly if patients have limited ovarian reserve i think four months will be sufficient okay okay um i'm just scrolling down i think we've actually 
we have a number of questions here about Varric Steel, and I think we have answered them. There's someone out there who wants to know where we can find the study on changes of lifestyle. Um, we'll send that to you, uh, Fanola, uh, after this, so that we don't need to worry about that one. I have one more question. This is just about um, theoretical sperm retrieval. My question is, if you have a person who's had three or a couple who've had three cycles of failed ICSI, and there's no there's no future pathway, what do you do with, with them? The, the alternative is sperm donation, or um, those who are interested in PGT would say, or oh, if you've got a euploid embryo, you know, that's the way to go. You don't need to worry about, about the sperm quality. But yeah. these people I want mean, to have These are patients with raised DNA fragmentation. No, I'm just talking to people who have failed ICSI, three failed cycles of ICSI. Yeah, I mean, I think it depends on, I think, you know, one of the things that I, for you say, I would do a DNA fragmentation uh, test in, in those patients and depend upon if it's raised, screen them, as we said, to look for the various other causes. Because often we, this is the type of patient we do see all the time. And I know you said we're getting closer together, which we are as a community of reproductive health specialists, but we're still seeing this perhaps polarity in terms of management. And so one of the things is this is the type of patient that we would see. So this is the type of patient who's had ART, comes to see us, and we kind of say, well, look, okay, what do we do now? And the problem there is it's emotionally quite difficult for the patient because they want an answer, they want a solution, and it's very difficult. So I think it is reasonable to do a DNA fragmentation in that setting. The problem arises in the patient that who has a DNA fragmentation that might be raised. You screen them for the microbiome, you look for a varix, you don't find this, you adopt lifestyle measures, you put them on antioxidants, you do all of this. And at the end of it, you say to them, okay, well, you can do another DNA fragmentation test, but if it's still raised or hasn't changed significantly, then what do you do? There is a talk, as we talked about earlier, about I talked earlier about DNA uh, doing testicular sperm extraction, <laughs> uh, taking sperm directly from the testicle both for men with very low sperm counts without obviously measuring their DNA fragmentation, although invariably it's going to be raised because their sperm parameters are low, but also in those with raised DNA fragmentation. I think the data is very weak. And we've just, as I think I spoke to you earlier, mm -hmm. have about to publish a study looking at meta-analysis, looking at all this pooled data. And whilst there is some evidence it might improve live birth rates, the data is weak because we don't control, as we've always talked about this, about number of cycles you do of ART, the higher the success rate. And therefore we're always doing testicular sperm extraction in the setting of high DNA fragmentation in patients who already had a number of cycles. Therefore, naturally, you probably are going to improve. Yeah, yeah, some yeah. Is yeah. studies that are controlled. So we need better studies. And the data is very weak. I mean, many of these studies didn't measure testicular sperm DNA fragmentation. Many of the studies didn't even report on the sperm DNA fragmentation. They said it was raised. So mm -hmm. one has to be careful. But that's the difficult problem. So I would in that setting do that. The wider question, of course, is sperm selection. You mentioned that, I think, in one of your slides at the beginning. Mm -hmm. What should we be doing? And obviously, if you look at the HEF, HFEA websites labeled as a red using these techniques such as Pixie, Max, um, Zymot. In fact, Zymot doesn't have that much data if you look at it, actually, no. published. No. Um, Swim techniques, however, as well. But certainly there would be some evidence based upon some of the trials and studies showing that some of these sperm selection techniques, depending on the female age, do have benefit and outcome. These are kind of, in men, with raised DNA fragmentation. The problem, what we must remember, is that we're not directly, of course, measuring sperm DNA fragmentation, but rather indirectly. The question really is about live birth rates and, you know, whether this improves it. So you might want to say, well, look, in those patients who have failed conventional ICSI, do you then move towards sperm selection if they don't want yes. to use donor sperm? So I think that there are these other options, but I mm -hmm. think these are very controversial options. Yeah. And I think patients must be well informed about the limitations and the controversy surrounding these 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 areas. But I think with adequate counselling, and I think an informed decision can be made. Yes. Well, in, in terms of the, the Have Select study, which I know you're referring to, Yes, when we brought out the Lancet paper, um, the HFEA gave it a, a, a red signal. When we brought out the second paper, where we showed very specifically that older women had less miscarriages using um, the pixie dishes, yes. I think I think the HFEA needs to revisit that because um, no. there are many, many older women who do not want to have a miscarriage, irrespective of whether they get a live birth. Yes. And I, I think... I think sometimes we can be too too careful. I've got one question, one last question here from Brian Woodward, and it's about barricades. Um, he said in the two 
2023 Canadian Urological Association suggests observation of varicoceles from most couples with testicular failure, um, non-obstructive azospermia and varicoceles considering surgical sperm retrieval and IV efficacy is compared with pre-treatment with varicocelectomy. Might you be able to explain what observation of varicoceles means? <laughs> I don't know. Um, <laughs> so if you've got somebody with non-obstructive azospermia, um, so the way I would manage somebody with non so you've got to go back at a little step. So non-obstructive agent spermia, so men with low testosterone, there is this vogue for fixing varicocils with low testosterone, which might improve testosterone. There are some studies showing that, particularly from uh, Goldstein in New York. If you look at the conventional treatment for varicocils in non-obstructive agent spermia meta-analysis, there is some evidence that fixing varicocils may produce sperm within the ejaculate in a proportion, I think, 10 to 15 percent. The problem is, again, it's that highlighted that whole issue about cryptosispermia. They may have been producing sperm anyway. However, having said that, there is some evidence that if you biopsy and there's biopsy changes, if you biopsy a test as pre uh, varicoselectomy, um, they may show maturation arrest, which then if you post uh, biopsy shows hyposomatogenesis. So there does seem to be some effects. But again, these are limited studies. In my practice, I think that if somebody's got a clinically significant varicocele grade three, for example, and a female partner of good ovarian reserve with non-obstructive age of spermia with a normal FSH, because FSH, and again, if you've got a high FSH, are you not, does that not indicate irreversible testicular failure? So in that setting, you might not want to fix the varicocele and move directly to sperm extraction. In the setting of patients with normal FSH, LH, or azospermic, then yes, it might be worth fixing the varicocele because you might, that patient, have maturation arrest, which you might then induce into hypersomatogenesis based upon histopathological data. So those are the kind of settings, but I think we've got to be careful that we're not overzealous in treating all varicocele. I'm not sure what they mean by uh, observation, really. I think, you know, they may argue that depending upon the female age, of course, as well. But we've got to remember varicocels are very common. I think they've got to be large, clinically significant before you're going to think about these aspects, even treating them. But we've also got to look at the FSH level as well, because that would be indicative of irreversible uh, hypogonadism or testicular failure. And therefore, you're probably not going to reverse the effects or get a positive result. Some people argue that you biopsy the testicle when you do a sperm extraction. Great if you find sperm. If you don't, it shows maturation rest. Then they've got a varicocele. You could fix it afterwards and then redo it. But again, data is so weak. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Well, we've come to the end of my questions. We've come to the end of the audience's questions. i just end with a couple of compliments. Um, brilliant information imparted here. I'm hoping to rewatch this. So there you go. And absolutely brilliant talk. Great to hear from such a passionate andrologist. And I concur with those comments. We really enjoyed this evening. We'd like to thank you very much for your time. You know how busy you are and really appreciate that. And it's now back to Lindsay just to, to close off the seminar. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Sheena. Many thanks again for joining with us this evening. And we hope you've enjoyed our 2023 series. We wish to thank all our speakers for taking the time to join us throughout the year. We will be in touch in due course with details of the 2024 series. Please do not hesitate to reach out if you have any queries and we hope you enjoy the rest of your evening.